Okay, hello again. This is chapter 10, Chemical Calculations. And we will be talking about how to calculate things in the syllabus. So, the first thing that you will be required to calculate is the mole. And the mole in chemistry is an amount of the substance. So, the amount of any substance in chemistry is regarded as the mole. And the mole is the relative atomic mass in grams. We have... Um, we will be talking about how to calculate the atomic mass uh, or the molecular mass and the molecular mass in grams that is what we call the mole now we've already talked about relative atomic mass and relative atomic mass is just the mass number the total of the mass numbers of the mass numbers of the isotopes in the ratio of their occurrence so the average of the mass number of the different isotopes in the ratio of their occurrence in nature relative to the mass of an atom of carbon 12 that is called the relative atomic mass it's basically the mass number that you have in the periodic table relative molecular mass that is the mass of one mole which is the sum of all the atomic masses of the atoms in the molecule so this is what we call molecular mass or mass of one mole so let us talk about how to calculate first the mass of one mole or molecular mass. This is the basic thing that you will be required to calculate. To calculate the molecular mass of, let's say, magnesium phosphate, the first thing that you are required to do is write the formula. How are you going to write the formula of magnesium phosphate? You remember magnesium, look at the periodic table, magnesium is Mg. Phosphate, you should know this is one of the things you're supposed to do. So phosphate is PO4 and the valencies, magnesium is in group 2, so the valency is 2 and phosphate, valency 3, this is one of the things you were supposed to memorize. Phosphate is valency 3, so you put 3 under the magnesium. Now, to determine the mass of one mole of this substance or the molecular mass of this substance, we just add up all the masses from the periodic table and remember that the mass in the periodic table is the big number so we're going to be adding the big numbers from the periodic table so you look at the periodic table what is magnesium you'll find that the big number or the mass number of magnesium is 24 how many magnesiums do i have in this molecule i have three atoms of magnesium so the 24 times three plus the next one the next one is phosphorus you look at the periodic table the mass number of phosphorus is 31 how many phosphorus do we have remember that we said anything outside the bracket applies to everything inside the bracket so in this case we have two phosphorus atoms so multiply 31 by 2 plus the next one the next one is oxygen now you have how many oxygens 2 times 4 you have 8 oxygens and its mass number is 16 so you multiply that Add them all up, that comes out to 262. This is the easiest thing you'll be required to calculate. Now, let's do another one. Let's try drawing the mass number of barium nitrate. First of all, how do I write the formula of barium nitrate? Barium is in group 2 in the periodic table. It is Ba. How do you write nitrate? Do you remember how to write nitrate? Nitrate is NO3. The valency of barium is 2 because it's in group 2. So you put 2 under the nitrate. And the valency of nitrate is 1. So this is the formula of barium nitrate. Now we want to calculate the mass of one mole. Well, we add up all the masses. So you look at the periodic table, you'll find that the mass of barium is 137. And you have only one barium. Can you see that you have only one barium? And then you have the next one is nitrogen. The, uh, its mass number is 14. How many nitrogens do we have? Can you see that we have two nitrogens? So 14 times 2 plus the oxygen, which is 16. You multiply by 6. 2 times 3, I have 6 oxygens. So that comes out to be a total of 261. Okay. The next thing you'll be required to do is to determine the empirical formula and the molecular formula of the substance. Empirical formula is the formula showing the simplest ratio between the elements. The molecular formula is the formula showing the actual ratios between the elements. So let us take a look at this. 
how do we determine the empirical formula or the molecular formula of the substances? This question says a compound has 18.2% potassium, 59.4% iodine, and the rest is oxygen. So he might give you the constituents in percentages or he might give it to you in grams. We treat it the same way. So here we have percentages. Okay, so potassium is 18.2%, iodine is 59.4%. Now when he says the rest is oxygen, that means I have how many oxygens? Or how much oxygen? You add up what he gives you, subtract it from 100, right? So that gives you that the potassium is 18.2, the iodine is 59.4, and the um, the rest, which is oxygen, is 22.4. Now you need to go through two main steps in order to determine the empirical formula. The first step is divide by molecular mass of each one or the atomic mass of each one. So you look at the periodic table. What is the mass number of potassium? What's the mass number of iodine? What's the mass number of oxygen? You divide each of them with the mass number. So potassium, you divide by 39. Iodine, you divide by 127. Oxygen, you divide by 16. Now, whatever numbers comes out from this division, you look at them. Which of them is the smaller? So I have 0 0.47, 0 0.47, 1 1.4. Which one is smaller? 0.47. I divide all through by 0.47. So the two steps are first divide by the mass number, then divide by the smallest in order to get the simplest ratio. Now, you should have a whole number at this point. So if you have uh, your answer is 1 or your answer is 2.9 or uh, 3.1, then you round it up to a whole number. And that means that the empirical formula is KiO3. Okay, let's try this question. A sample of a hydrocarbon with mass 7.2 grams contained 6 grams of carbon. Now, if you don't remember from organic chemistry anything, you, uh, just keep in mind that the word hydrocarbon means something that has hydrogen and carbon. So he's saying it has a, the total hydrocarbon has a mass of 72. So all of it is 7. Sorry, 7.2 grams, and it contains six grams of carbon. So that means that the rest of the seven is the hydrogen. So how do we get the empirical formula of that? The carbon is 6 grams and all of it is 7.2 so the hydrogen is 1.2 grams so these are the masses and we treat it in exactly the same way as we did the first time first we divide by what first we divide by the mass number so the mass number of carbon is 12 mass number of hydrogen is 1 I end up with 0.5 and 1.2 what was the next step divide by the smallest so which one is the smallest 0.5 or 1.2 0.5 so I divide all through by 0.5 and I come out with numbers that say 1 and 2.4 now if you have something in the middle 2.3 2.4 2.5 2.6 something like that 2.7 you do not round them up you round them up to a whole number only if it is a 0 0.0 or a point 1 or a point 0.9 then you round them up otherwise you need to change this into a whole number in order to change it to a whole number you need to multiply it by something that makes it a whole number so when i see this 2.4 the first thing i do is okay let's multiply by 2 does that give me a whole number no multiply by 3 does it give a whole number no multiply by 4 multiply by 5 i find that it will give me whole numbers so i multiply all through by 5 i multiply all the ratio by 5 so instead of 1 to 2.4, it is now 5 to 12. So that means that my empirical formula is something that has 5 carbons and 12 hydrogens. So my answer is B. Do we understand that? This is a kind of experiment in which he says the mineral so-and-so contains crystals of hydrated iron sulfate. So I have hydrated iron sulfate. A uh, hydrated salt is something that has water in its crystals. So this is iron sulfate with a certain amount of water in the crystals and we don't know what the amount is and the student wants to find the value of X. She does this kind of experiment. She uses this apparatus to remove and collect the water of crystallization from a sample of iron 2 sulfate crystals. She uses this method. Now, the first thing she did was weigh an empty tube A 
to find its mass. So she knows the mass of the tube alone. Place a sample of hydrated iron 2 sulfate crystals into tube A and reweigh. So now she can get the mass of the hydrated iron sulfate crystals. Now heat tube A. We're heating the tube A because we're trying to get all the water out. So I have the mass of the iron sulfate at the beginning with the water. Now when I heat it, I remove the water, heat the tube, allow the tube to cool and reweigh and repeat the process until the mass no longer changes so that I'm sure that all the water has come out and then I weigh it again. So heating until the mass no longer changes is known as heating to constant mass. When iron 2 sulfate crystals are heated gently, they decompose according to this equation. So when you heat the hydrated salt, you lose the water and it becomes what we call anhydrous. So the FeSO4 alone is called anhydrous salt. Okay. These are the student's results. So, the student measured the mass of the tube alone and got that. And then mass of the tube and the hydrated salt. And then mass of the tube and contents after heating. So, that is just the salt without any water in it. So, state why it's necessary to heat the crystals to constant mass. We said we have to heat the crystals to constant mass to make sure that all the water is removed. Calculate the mass of iron sulfate formed after heating to constant mass. So how do we do that? I have the mass of the tube alone. And I have the mass of the tube and contents after heating. So if I subtract them, then I get the mass of the iron sulfate without the water. Now, calculate the mass of the water. The mass of the water, how do you get the mass of the water? He has a mass of tube A and the hydrated and the mass of tube A and the contents after heating. So if he subtracts that, then that is the mass of water. So now we have the mass of the iron sulfate alone and the mass of the water alone. And he's saying use that to calculate the value of X in the formula. So we have iron sulfate is 3.8. The water is 1.8. So basically, we're trying to get an empirical formula. It's as if we're trying to get an empirical formula. And we said, how do we get empirical formula? We divide first by the molecular mass of each one. And whatever numbers come out, we divide them by the smallest. And that comes out 1 to 4. That means 1 mole of iron sulfate will have 4 moles of water. And that means my x is 4. Do we understand how we got that? Okay, this is another experiment. The student prepared crystals of hydrated magnesium sulfate. After drying the crystals, the student weighs them and then heats them until they reach a constant mass. This equation represents the change that occurs. So he has the hydrated magnesium sulfate and he's removing the water. And these are the student's results. Mass of dry crystals after heating is 17.2. So this is the crystals alone without water. Mass of dry, sorry, before heating, sorry. The first one is before heating. So that is the mass of the hydrated salt. Mass of crystals after heating, that is the mass of the salt alone without the water. And we need to use that to get what is the mass of magnesium sulfate alone and what is the mass of the water alone. So how do we get the mass of the magnesium sulfate alone? That is the mass of crystals after heating to constant mass. So the mass of magnesium sulfate alone is 8.3. Now the mass of dry crystals before heating is the magnesium sulfate plus the water. So if I want the water, I just subtract them from each other. So now I have that magnesium sulfate is 8.3, water is 8.9. I divide by the molecular mass of each one and then divide the numbers that come out with the smaller one and I get a ratio of 1 to 7 and that means that x is 7. These are an important kind of question that is repeated many times. Okay, the next thing we need to do is how do we calculate number of moles? So he will either tell you to calculate molecular mass or get the empirical formula or number of moles. Now, to get the number of moles, we have actually three different uh, equations that we can use depending on what he gives me. So if he gives me the mass of something and he says calculate the number of moles, so I'm going to use this first equation. And this you have to memorize. 
number of moles is mass over molecular mass. Number of moles is written as n, mass is a small m, molecular mass is mr. So number of moles is mass over molecular mass. Now from that equation, if he gives me moles and molecular mass, can I get the mass? How do I get mass? Number of moles times mr. Okay, so if I'm trying to get number of moles, it's mass over molecular mass. If I'm trying to get mass, it's number of moles times molecular mass. Okay, I use this only if I have masses. I'm dealing with masses. But what if I'm not dealing with masses? If I'm dealing with a gas? Now a gas, he will usually give me the volume of the gas and ask me to get the number of moles. So in that case, the number of moles is volume over 24. Number of moles is volume over 24 and remember the volume has to be in decimeter cubed so if he gives it to me in centimeter cubed i have to divide it by a thousand before i can put it in this equation now if i know that number of moles is volume over 24 but what if i'm trying to get volume you should realize that means that volume is number of moles times 24 Okay, what if we don't have mass and he's not talking about gases, he's talking about solutions. If he talks about solutions, he usually talks about concentration of the solution, volume of the solution. In that case, number of moles is concentration times volume. So number of moles is concentration times volume. And again, the volume has to be in decimeter cubed. If he gives it to you in centimeter cubed, you have to divide it by a thousand. And if we say number of moles is concentration times volume, what if he's trying to get concentration? Then concentration is the number of moles of, over volume. Or volume is the number of moles over concentration. You should be able to play around with these equations. So just learn the main equations and then play around with them depending on what he wants. So let's try this. Calculate the number of moles of sulfuric acid. So this is a solution in 20 centimeter cubed of a one mole per decimeter cubed solution. First of all, you have to know that anything centimeter cubed, that's volume. And anything mole per decimeter cubed, that is concentration. So we have a solution, he gives me the volume, he gives me the concentration and asking me to calculate the number of moles. How do we calculate number of moles? Number of moles is concentration times volume. Concentration is one. The volume is 20 centimeter cubed, so I have to divide it by 1,000 if I put it in this equation, and that ends up with 0 0.02 mole. Okay? Okay, let's try another one. What is the concentration in mole per decimeter cubed of a solution containing 7.84 grams of phosphoric acid in 400 centimeter cubed of solution? Okay, he's asking for concentration. And I know that concentration is number of moles over volume. But then he's not giving me the number of moles, he's giving me the mass. So I have to use this to get the number of moles first. So number of moles is mass over molecular mass of phosphoric acid. The mass is 7.84 and I calculate the molecular mass. Do you remember how to calculate molecular mass? Each hydrogen is one. I have three hydrogens, so that's three. Plus one phosphorus, which is 31, plus four oxygens which is 16 times 4 and I get that the number of moles is 0 0.08 mole. Now that I have the number of moles I can use it in the equation that says concentration is number of moles over volume in order to get concentration and I end up with concentration of 0.2. Do we understand that? <clears throat> okay. A chemist wants to find out the percentage of iron 2 in an iron tablet. She uses this method. Weigh an iron tablet, dissolve the tablet in excess acid, titrate the solution with KMnO4. The table shows her results. So the mass of the tablet was this. The concentration of the solution was this. And the volume of the solution was this. And the first question says calculate the amount in moles. So usually when he says calculate the amount, that means he's telling you calculate number of moles of KMnO4 in 17.4 centimeter cubed of 0.02 mole per decimeter cubed. Okay, he wants number of moles and we're talking about a solution. He gives me volume and concentration. So in this case, the number of moles is concentration times volume. Concentration. 
<clears throat> concentration is 0.02 and the volume in centimeter cubed, so you need to divide it by 1,000 in this equation. That ends up with 3.48 times 10 to the minus 4 mole. Then he says, in the titration, one mole of potassium permanganate reacts with five moles of iron 2. That means one mole gives five moles. So calculate the number of moles of iron 2. If I have this number of moles that I calculated in A, 3.48 times 10 to the minus 4, if I have one, it gives five. So if I have 3.48 times 10 to the minus 4, it will give how much? So you multiply that by five. So the number of moles of iron 2 plus is this. Do we understand that? Then he says calculate the mass. So I have number of moles and I want mass. So you should realize that mass is number of moles times MR. Number of moles times MR means I have 0 0.0974 grams of iron 2 plus in the iron tablet. Then the next question says calculate the percentage by mass of the iron 2. Remember in the table he gave me a mass of the tablet. The total mass of the tablet is 0 0.298. Now, I calculated that out of this 0.298, I have only 0.0974 grams, which is iron 2. So, to get the percentage, is that over the total times 100. So, that means I have 32.7% of the tablet is iron 2, please. Okay? Now, one thing that you need to know, one mole of any gas occupies a, mo a volume of 24 decimeter cubed. And that's why we said number of moles of gases is volume over 24. Now, Avogadro's law states that equal volumes of gases contain the same number of particles. So one mole of any substance, they decided, has 6.02 times 10 to 23 atoms, or 6.02 times 10 to 23 molecules. This is a very huge number. So one mole of anything contains a very huge number of atoms, so you can calculate the number of atoms in 2 moles or 5 moles or 10 moles and so on. So you have to know that one mole of any substance, if we're talking about how many particles or how many atoms or how many molecules or how many ions, one mole has 6.02 times 10 to the 23 particles. Okay? The other thing you will be required to do is to calculate reacting masses and volumes from equation. So if you have an equation like this, a balanced equation actually has a very important meaning to a chemist. So if I say that Na2CO3 reacts with 2HCl to give 2NaCl plus H2O plus CO2, what does that actually mean? The numbers in front of each one is called coefficient and it represents the ratio of moles. So this balanced equation actually tells me if there is no number, of course, you are assuming the number is 1. So that means that if I have 1 mole of sodium carbonate, it will need to react with 2 moles of HCl. So the number of moles of HCl will always be twice the number of moles of sodium carbonate. And then this gives what? This gives 2 moles of sodium chloride. So the number of moles of the sodium chloride is twice that of sodium carbonate. And 1 mole of water and 1 mole of CO2. That's what the equation tells me. So from the balanced equation, I know the ratio of moles. So if I know the number of moles of one, I can tell the, ratio, the number of moles of the others. Okay? So let us say, the question says, what is the volume of HCl? needed to react with 5.3 grams of sodium carbonate if the concentration of HCl is 2 mole per decimeter cube. So let's try and do that. He's asking about HCl, but he actually gives me information of, about sodium carbonate. So I need to use the information of sodium carbonate in order to get what he's asking about for HCl. So if he gives me 5.3 grams of sodium carbonate, the first thing I need to do is get the number of moles of sodium carbonate. Now, 5.3 grams, that means I need to use the equation that says number of moles is mass over molecular mass. So number of moles is the mass, 5.3 grams, and you calculate the molecular mass of sodium carbonate, and that comes out to be 0 0.05 mole. Then I relate this from the equation. From the equation, the equation says if I have one mole of sodium carbonate, 
the number of moles of HCl should be twice of that. So if I have 0.05 mole of sodium carbonate, then the number of moles of HCl is twice that. So that is 0.1 mole. And then from that, from the number of moles, I can determine the volume. I know that the volume is number of moles over concentration. So the number of moles divided by the concentration will give me the volume. Remember that the volume comes out from the equation originally in decimeter cubed. If you want to change it to centimeter cubed, you multiply by 1,000. Okay, 2.5 grams of calcium carbonate were heated to give calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Write the balanced chemical equation for the reaction, determine the mass of calcium oxide, and determine the volume of carbon dioxide. So let's write the balanced equation first. He has calcium carbonate. How do we write calcium carbonate? Calcium is Ca. What is carbonate? Carbonate is CO3. So, and the valency of calcium is 2, and the valency of carbonate is 2. So calcium carbonate is CaCO3. And he says this is heated to give calcium oxide, also calcium valency 2, oxygen valency 2. So the 2 and 2 cancel, plus CO2. So this is my equation. Is it balanced or do I need balancing? If you will sit down and, and check it, it is balanced. So that's my balanced chemical equation. Now, what is he asking about? He's asking about the mass of calcium oxide, but he doesn't give me anything about calcium oxide. What does he tell me? He says I have 2.5 grams of calcium carbonate. So I need to use that first to get the number of moles of calcium carbonate and then relate it to the calcium oxide. So number of moles of calcium carbonate is mass over molecular mass. So 2.5 over the molecular mass of calcium carbonate. That comes out to be 0.025 mole. And then I relate from the equation. Now that I know the number of moles of calcium carbonate, how does that relate to the number of moles of calcium oxide? Well, the equation says if this is 1, this is 1. So the number of moles of calcium oxide will be the same. Number of moles of calcium oxide is the same as number of moles of calcium carbonate, so that's 0.025. Then I can get the mass of calcium oxide. The mass is number of moles times MR, and the MR here is that of calcium oxide. So that tells me that the mass of calcium oxide that I should get is 1.4 grams. Do we understand that? Okay. The next thing is asking about the volume of carbon dioxide. So I relate again the number of moles. Number of moles of carbon dioxide from the equation is the same as number of moles of calcium carbonate. So that will be the 0.025. And then how do I get volume of carbon dioxide? We said volume of a gas is number of moles times 24. So when I do that, I get 0.6 decimeter cubed. If I want it in centimeter cubed, I multiply by a thousand. Okay. Another question, 9.8 grams of potassium chlorate was heated to give potassium chloride and oxygen. Write the balanced chemi chemical equation for the reaction, determine the mass of potassium chloride formed, and determine the volume of oxygen produced. So let's write the balanced equation first. Potassium chlorate is something that you don't know how to write because we didn't mention what is chlorate in the symbol, in the syllabus. But then he gives you the formula of potassium chlorate. So potassium chlorate, he says, is KClO3. This was heated to give what? Potassium chloride. How do I write potassium chloride? KCl. Valency of this is 1 and the other is 1. Plus oxygen. How do I write oxygen? Remember that oxygen is diatomic. Then you balance. How do you balance? 1K, 1K, 1Cl, 1Cl. Now, it's the oxygen that is not balanced. Now, 1 is 3 and the other is 2. So if I put 3 here and 2 here, they're both 6. But that means that I have 2K and 2Cl, so I have to put 2K and 2Cl. Can you see the balancing? Okay, now he wants mass of potassium chloride. How do I get mass of potassium chloride? Well, I need to determine the number of moles of KClO3 first, related to the number of moles of KCl, and then I can get mass of KCl. So number of moles of KClO3 is mass, 9.8, over the molecular mass of KClO3. That comes out to be 0 0.08 moles. Now, how, do we, how does that relate to the number of moles of KCl? Well, the equation tells me if this is 2, this is 2. And that means that the number of moles of KCl is the same as the number of moles of the KClO3. Now that I know number of moles, can I get mass? Mass is number of moles times MR. So the number of moles that I have found times the MR of the KCl, that says 5.96 
grams. So that means that if I'm starting with 9.8 grams of potassium chlorate, I should end up with 5.96 grams of KCl. The next thing, determine the volume of oxygen. So again, in order to determine the volume of oxygen, I have to determine the number of moles. How do I determine the number of moles? By the relationship in the equation. The equation tells me that if I have two moles of KClO3, this will give me three moles of O2. So if I have 0.08, how much should that give me? That should give me 0.08 times 3 over 2. Can you see? Cross multiplication. So that means that number of moles of oxygen is 0.12 mole. And that means I can get the volume of the gas. The volume of the gas is number of moles times 24. And that comes out to be 2.88 decimeter cubed. Can you think about these things? Okay. Let's try this one. Hydrobromic acid reacts with magnesium carbonate to form a solution containing magnesium bromide. Crystals of hydrated magnesium bromide can be obtained from this solution. An excess of hydrobromic acid is reacted with 0.125 mole of magnesium carbonate. So the HBr, hydrobromic acid in the first equation, is reacted with 0.125 mole of magnesium carbonate. Show by calculation that the maximum theoretical mass of hydrated magnesium bromide that can be made is 36.5. So basically he's saying I'm starting with 0.125 mole of magnesium carbonate. Now he's telling me find out the mass of the hydrated salt form and it should be 36.5. So prove that it is 36.5. Okay, so the first thing that we do is relate the number of moles to find number of moles of magnesium bromide. So if I have 0.125 mole and remember, this is mole, not gram. So he already calculated number of moles of magnesium carbonate, and he found that it's 0.125. Now I look at the equation, magnesium carbonate and magnesium bromide. Well, if this is 1, this is 1. So the number of moles of the hydrated magnesium bromide is the same. Now I need the mass. So mass is number of moles times the MR, and he already gives me the MR. Remember, if you're trying to use MR, check to see if he already gives you the MR so that you don't sit down and calculate it and waste time. Okay, so that means that I should get 36.5 grams of the hydrated salt. Now, in an experiment using 0.125 mole of magnesium carbonate with an excess of hydrobromic acid, the mass of hydrated magnesium bromide obtained is 26.4. Do you understand that? Yeah, he's supposed to get 36.5, but when he actually did it in the lab, he got less. And this is usually what happens. So theoretically, we're supposed to get 36.5. But actually, when we do the experiment in the lab, we always end up with less than what we should get. So suggest so two reasons why the actual mass obtained is less than the maximum. So why would I in the lab get less than what I'm supposed to get? Always remember that when you're working in the lab, you can determine that some of the magnesium carbonate did not react. Maybe some of it did not react. Not all the magnesium carbonate reacted. Or the original magnesium carbonate was not pure. Or some of the solid was lost on a filter paper if he wants uh, a third one. Okay. The student does an experiment to produce a precipitate of lead iodide using the following reaction. He finds that 5 cm cubed of 0.9 mole per decimeter cubed of potassium iodide reacts with 8 cm cubed of lead nitrate. Calculate the concentration of lead nitrate. Okay, so now he gives me information about Ki. And he's asking me about something related to lead nitrate. So I need to use this information of Ki to get its number of moles. Relate the number of moles in the equation to that of lead nitrate and then determine what he's asking for. Okay, that's how we, we go about it. So the first thing is I do the number of moles. Number of moles of Ki, because this is a solution, he gives me concentration and he gives me volume. So I use the equation that says number of moles is concentration times volume. Always remember to put the volume in decimeter cube. So this means that I have 4.5 times 10 to minus 3 mole of Ki. Now I relate it to the equation. Where is the equation? The equation says 
that lead nitrate, there is no number in front of it, so one mole of lead nitrate reacts with how much of Ki? Reacts with two moles, so that means that the number of moles of Ki is always twice that of lead nitrate. So I have a certain number of moles of Ki, how do I get number of moles of lead nitrate? I divide by 2 to get the number of moles of lead nitrate. Now that I have number of moles, I can get concentration. How do we get concentration? Concentration is number of moles over volume. So the number of moles that I calculated over the volume, and that comes out to be 0.281 mole per decimeter cube. Okay. Another question. A chemist neutralizes 25 centimeter cubed of 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid with slaked lime. Slaked lime is the calcium hydroxide. Calculate the amount in moles of HCl that is neutralized. So he gives me information about HCl and he says get the number of moles. This HCl is a solution. He gives me volume. He gives me concentration. So the number of moles is concentration times volume. Always volume divided by 1000 because it was in centimeter cube. So I calculate that number of moles of HCl is 0 0.01. To five mole. Now he is saying calculate the minimum mass of calcium hydroxide required to neutralize the HCl. So the mass of calcium hydroxide that I need, I need to get number of moles first. So I need to relate the number of moles of HCl to the number of moles of calcium hydroxide. I look at the equation. Number of moles of calcium hydroxide is half of the number of moles of HCl because the equation says one reacts with two. So the number of moles of calcium hydroxide should be half what I got for the number of moles of HCl. And then I use this number of moles to get mass. Mass is number of moles times MR. And he already gives me the MR of calcium hydroxide. So I just put it. And that means that the mass of calcium hydroxide is 0.463 grams. Okay. Calculate the mass of oxygen required to completely react with 0.6 grams of magnesium. Sit down and try this question first before going on. So he's saying I have 0.6 grams of magnesium. So the first thing I need to do is get the number of moles of magnesium. Number of moles is mass over molecular mass. So that comes out to be 0.025. And then I relate it to the number of moles of oxygen from the equation. Two of magnesium reacts with one of oxygen. So that means that number of moles of oxygen is half that of magnesium. And then what does he ask for? He wants mass. So mass of oxygen is number of moles times M. Were you able to get this answer? Okay. Another question. Hydrobromic acid can be neutralized by adding sodium hydroxide solution. A solution of hydrobromic acid has a concentration of 0.2. Calculate the number of moles of HBr in 20 cm cubed of the HBr solution. So he gives me the concentration, 0.2. He gives me the volume, 20 cm cubed. So number of moles is concentration times volume. Okay. Then, calculate the volume of 0.1 mole uh, per decimeter cube sodium hydroxide needed to exactly neutralize it. So, I look at the equation. If I have number of moles of HBr, what is the number of moles of sodium hydroxide? The equation says they're the same. One reacts with one. So, the number of moles of HBr is the same as number of moles of sodium hydroxide. And then, he's asking for volume. Volume is number of moles over concentration. And that comes out to be 0.04 decimeter cubed. Okay. In another neutralization reaction, a student uses 30 centimeter cubed of 0.2 mole per decimeter cubed aqueous sodium hydroxide. So this is the same equation up there and he's saying calculate the mass of sodium hydroxide contained in the solution. So again, you do number of moles, concentration times volume, and then you do the mass. The mass is number of moles times MR, and that gives you 0.24 grams. Are you feeling better about all of this? Okay. Another thing you will be required to calculate is the percent purity. Percent purity is the mass of the pure substance over the impure times 100. For example, this question says an excess of hydrochloric acid was added to 1.23 grams of impure barium carbonate. The word, immediately you see impure barium carbonate, that means that you're not going to use that mass 
to get anything. Okay? The volume of carbon dioxide collected was this. So this is the information that I need to use. The impurities did not react with the acid. Calculate the percent purity. So if he gives me volume of carbon dioxide, then I can use it to get number of moles. Then I can relate it to the number of moles of barium carbonate so that I can find exactly how much barium carbonate reacted. Then I can get the percent purity. So if I say 1.23 grams of impure barium carbonate, that's not the mass of barium carbonate. That's the mass of barium carbonate and other things which, which are impurities. So the first thing we need to do is get the number of moles of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a gas, he gives me volume, so it is volume over 24, so that is 0 0.005. Then I relate it from the equation. The equation says CO2 is 1, barium carbonate is 1. Number of moles of CO2 is the same as number of moles of barium carbonate, so number of moles of barium carbonate is the same. Then, from the number of moles, I can get the mass. The mass of barium carbonate is number of moles times MR. So that means that out of the 1.23 grams, only 0.985 grams is actually barium carbonate. The rest is impurity. So the percent purity is the 0.985 over the total times 100. And that means that this sample is 80.1% uh, of barium carbonate. Okay. To calculate percent yield. Percent yield is the actual yield over the theoretical yield times 100. For example, we said we are supposed to get from our calculation, we are supposed to get a certain mass. We said we don't usually get that mass, we usually get less of that mass. So what we actually got over what we should get times 100, that is my percent yield. Okay? Okay, so... This is a question, 4.8 grams of hydrogen reacted with excess nitrogen to give 12.8 grams of ammonia. Calculate the percent yield of ammonia. So he gives me information about hydrogen and he's asking me about ammonia. How much am I supposed to get of ammonia? He's saying he got 12.8, but that's his own. That's his actual yield. I'm supposed to calculate what he should get first in order to calculate the percent yield. Okay, so he says we started with 4.8 grams of hydrogen. So the first thing I should do is get the number of moles of hydrogen. Number of moles is mass of the molecular mass of hydrogen. Remember, this is hydrogen H2, so the molecular mass is 2. This gives 2.4 moles. Now, I relate it to the ammonia. What does the, um, what does the equation say? The equation says... If I have 3 moles of hydrogen, it will give 2 moles of ammonia. So if I have 2.4, how much would that give me? Cross multiplication, number of moles of ammonia will be 2.4 times 2 over 3. So that means that number of moles of ammonia is 1.6 mole. Okay? That means what would be the mass of ammonia? The mass is number of moles times MR. Number of moles is 1.6 times the MR of NH3. That comes out to be 27.2 grams. That's me that means if he starts with 4.8 grams of hydrogen, he is supposed to get 27.2 grams. Well, but what did he actually get? He got 12.8. So the percent yield is the 12.8 over the total that he should get times 100. So his percent yield is 47%. Are we okay with this? Okay, the other thing is limiting reactants. Limiting reactants applies if it gives me information about two reactants or more than one reactant. So here, here, for example, he's saying I have 50 grams of nitrogen and 40 grams of hydrogen. They're allowed to react. Calculate the number of grams of ammonia that could be formed. So he gives me information about nitrogen and he gives me information about hydrogen. So am I going to relate the ammonia to the nitrogen or to the hydrogen? Well, I have to determine which one is limiting and which one is excessing. One of them is much more than it should be, so that is excess. And the other one is less than it should be, so that is the limiting. And we usually relate it to the limiting. Anything that's excess, you don't use in your calculations. So let us determine which one is excess. If I have 50 grams of nitrogen, that means that the number of moles is what? 
number of moles is mass over molecular mass that is 1.79 mole so i have 1.79 mole of nitrogen now if i have 40 grams of hydrogen the number of moles of hydrogen is mass over molecular mass so that is 20 moles so that means that he's reacting 1.79 mole of nitrogen with 20 moles of hydrogen but the equation says that the hydrogen should be three times that of the nitrogen. So the number of moles of hydrogen should be three times the number of moles of nitrogen. If I have 1.79, let's say 1.8, 1.8 times three, that's way less than 20 mole. So obviously hydrogen is excess. Now, when I decide that hydrogen is excess, that means it is too much more than needed then I don't use this to relate to any other thing. Yeah, I'm not going to use the number of moles of hydrogen to get the number of moles of ammonia because the hydrogen is excess, it is too much, not all the 20 moles were used. So I need to use the limiting re reactant. So in this case, the limiting reagent or the limiting reactant is my nitrogen. So I'm going to relate the number of moles of ammonia to the number of moles of nitrogen and say, okay, if from the equation one mole of nitrogen gives two moles of ammonia so if i have 1.79 mole of nitrogen how many moles of ammonia should i get so the number of moles of ammonia is 3.58 it's twice of that and that means that the mass of ammonia is number of moles times mr so that is 60.9 do we understand the idea of limiting range so whichever one is too much is called excess and you don't use it to relate to anything else you use the limiting Okay, so that's the end of this lesson. Please go and study this chapter. This is a very important chapter. Go back and study it. Try all the questions and we'll talk together about what the correct answers are in the next lesson. Okay.